All right. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome to the program a USC professor of law and author of the N-word theory, race, language, unequal justice, and the law, Professor Jody David Armour. Welcome to the program, Jody. Thanks very much for having me, Sam. So, all right, I, we got to start with with this. I, um, oh, I have, uh, you know, I was I was talking to my daughter about who was a, a guest on my show. She's uh, 15 years old, and uh, now she's around the house a lot more these days because she's not going to school um, or she's doing it from remote. And she's like, you cannot say the the title actually spells the word out uh, G G A. Yeah. And she said, you can't say that on air. And I said, well, I'm, my plan is to ask the professor, like, what, you know, a, about that. Um, and she said, well, just make sure you don't say that on air. And I think, like, it is, uh, I, I think, I, I've had a different perspective on the, the use of the word, even in this context, right? I mean, you've written the book, um, and... Um, it, it's the name of a theory that you've been working on for, uh, you know, uh, at least half a decade. Um, and, uh, but yet, you know, so, I mean, talk just about that word in the context of the title and your perspective on where it's appropriate to use that word. Yeah, that's a just a uh, perfect jumping off point, uh, Sam. It is a blood soaked epithet that has deep roots that run into a painfully racist American past. Right. It's been used to denigrate and otherize and demonize uh, blacks for centuries. And so I use it very advisedly and, and recognize that there's a lot of pain comes with it. But I also don't subscribe to the claim that any current day applications of that word are poison fruit. They're tainted fruit of the poison etymological tree that has roots in that racist past. I think that some black artists, for example, Tupac Shakur, Ice Cube, Nas, you know, Hope, there have been uh, artists, uh, black artists who have appropriated that term and used it as a term of art in a oppositional discourse, right? In a political discourse um, in which they're saying, we don't want you to just talk about us we want to talk about ourselves. We're going to penetrate pop culture with an inward laden discourse that's uncomfortable and disruptive. That's kind of part of the point of it, right? When I first started using the N-word in the legal academy, I used it in the same spirit that Black Lives Matter uh, uses disruption. Shut it down. Let's cut through our collective complacency about this festering issue. And, and sometimes we have to be disruptive to do that. And then let's compel some uncomfortable conversation. So I'm drawing on that Black Lives Matter spirit with this title to challenge us to disrupt our, you know, kind of calcified language of the academy when it comes to mass incarceration and racialized mass incarceration and get down to the nitty gritty, how we otherize black people through language and through other means in, in, in this culture and country. So in the, in the, in the, and, and I, 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 you know, I know there's obviously more to this, but I do find this topic fascinating. You know, one of my heroes uh, as in, in comedy was Lenny Bruce and he had a very famous, um, a uh, bit where he basically said, "We're gonna, we're gonna di um, um, disempower this word." Essentially, I'm paraphrasing, and uh, I think we could do that if the president came out and basically said, uh, "The president of the United States said, here is my N-word, uh, you know, uh, Secretary of Defense, and my N-word Secretary of Housing, and my N-word this, and my N-word that," and he just kept repeating the word with the idea that we're going to demystify it we're going to disempower it. And I mean, my sense is that perspective might have worked at that time, I guess, but in some ways we've achieved a sort of like a different level of consciousness that it's not just intent. And I think this has happened for me too over the years, because in, in very narrow circumstances, 10 years ago, I would have used this like in public in on the radio to make a specific point or to retell something that I'm not so sure I'm so comfortable with today, um, just because of, of a different awareness. But so it's not just the intent. There is a whole s set of of criteria that contextualize it. Is that right? Absolutely. And I love that, and, and that's it's part, the title is meant to provoke that kind of reflection all the time, constantly, ongoingly, right? 
Um, but I like your reference to the comedian Lenny Bruce because that's also part of the inspiration for my title, Sam. You know, the N word, you know, some people say the GGA version is not the bad version. It's the GG, it's the GGER version. You know, that's the bad version. And um, in some way, um, and um, when you hear a, a, a routine by someone like Chris Rock, to launch his comedic career in the late in the mid '90s, a routine called, called um, "Bring the Pain." He goes back and forth in front of an uh, all-black audience and saying the following um, routine. I, I, I'll, I'll uh, censor the N-word a little bit in here. Um, he says it's like a civil war going on in Black America, and there's two sides: there's black people and there's N-words, and N-words have got to go. I love black people, but I hate. In words, boy, I wish they let me join the Ku Klux Klan. I do a drive by from here to Brooklyn. And he goes on like that for a half hour, distinguishing between lovable black people and morally condemnable N words. And his core definition of a N word, of an N I G G A, is a black criminal. So, by that definition, Sam, the up to 90% of young black males, tragically, who are going to wind up in jail on probation or on parole in some of these inner city neighborhoods are in words we're willing to accept a political invitation implicit in a punchline that invites that distinction within the black community and we all laugh at that amen laugh at the punchline and and embrace it so that's what this book is also about attacking any kind of distinction between the worthy and the wicked based on your criminal record even a violent criminal record. And I think the N word is, is one of the words in the English language, it's unique in the English language, it's unparaphrasable, and it otherizes its referent probably more than any other word in the English language. So I wanna attack that otherization. I wanna dis eliminate distinguish distinctions between good Negroes, bad Negroes, lovable black people, morally condemnable N-I-G-G-A's. I mean, in, in many respects, that, that that Chris Rock um, uh, performance, that bit, is really sort of the fundamental manifestation of, I guess, maybe the catalyst or the need for the N-word theory that you've written about. That's it. You put that, that, you hit it squarely. And, and so, and, and, and there's, 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 there's two things that strike me about that. And I wonder if they, they, well, and let me see if I can articulate this. So it seems to me that what Chris Rock is doing in that, uh, in that bit is he is making a class distinction, right? And a class that is um, uh, fundamentally e economic. I mean, it's an, you know, I'm, I'm by class, I don't mean category. I mean class as the way that we speak about as class. And I wonder if, okay, so that's one thing there. And he's making that class distinction in front of a black audience. Yes. And yes. then I'm I'm curious as to how that class communicate class distinction gets communi communicated and maybe transformed or uh, within a a broader uh, society dominated by white people. Like yes. you know, if that is a class distinction within the black community, what happens to that as it comes out into the white community as well? Yeah, spot on. You know. What is really going on, I try to drive home in this book, is a lot of these moral distinctions are really class distinctions masquerading as moral distinctions. It just so happens, Sam, that when you look at the uh, crime rates for middle class black Americans and middle class white Americans, they're roughly the same. So really, most of the um, folks that Chris Rock would be pointing to that are blacks who are involved in crime are from truly disadvantaged backgrounds. They're truly disadvantaged blacks. So what Chris Rock would might as well might just as well as say is I love disproportionately middle class blacks and I hate disproportionately truly disadvantaged blacks, right? I love disproportionately privileged black Brahmin, the black bourgeoisie, and I hate the disproportionately truly disadvantaged black because that's the numbers. You just look at the, the you just crunch the numbers, right? And um, I even see it here in my neighborhood in. LA, you know, which uh, I live in View Park, it's called Black Beverly Hills. And I've had when I've had some of my neighbors say when I and some of my sons have had friends from other neighborhoods like Compton, Watts, et cetera, visit us. I've had neighbors say we don't want Watts up here. We don't want South Central up here. 
right? So there's an economically gated mentality that is de can develop even among the black bourgeoisie that I've seen point blank. So it is about both class and race, but the thing is you can't reduce race to class because as Stevie Wonder once said, you might make big cash, but you cannot cash in your face. And the face of crime for millions of Americans is black. And that's why you see so many black Brahmins, you know, the rage of the privileged class. Ellis Post had a book out years ago about all these black doctors and lawyers who are high achievers who are still getting racially profiled and they were enraged by it. So even though you make a lot of money, you cannot escape the black tax in that way. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, in the, in the like, I, I you know, using my own experience, you know, they, there is a, a concept in, I guess, cultural Judaism, like this is good for the Jews or bad for the Jews. Like there is, you know, Bernie Madoff was really upsetting uh, to, you know, my uh, relatives because it's bad for the Jews to have a Jew come out and do this or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like how much of that is going on in this in this dynamic and that, and how much does that dynamic then end up? I mean, I, I mean, I think you, you've, you just articulated it, but I, I'm just curious to, to pull that out a little bit more, that dynamic where it's like, ugh, you know, why do you have to, why do you and I have to be conjoined in the same community? I'm going to try and cleave us as much as possible. But unfortunately what happens is that comes back around and you, you don't have control of your fate in that context. That's again, man, that, that, that's right on because one of the things I drive uh, home in this book is that there has been in the black community for a long time, a politics of respectability. It, was, it, it worked back in the civil rights era in which the black community said, many rather leaders in the black community said, our racial reputation in the eyes of whites is very important. We have to do all we can do to enhance our racial reputation in the eyes of whites because they are policymakers. They're decision makers. They're deciding the fate of our community. And so we have to look good in their eyes so that they'll make favorable judgments when they're balancing those competing interests. Right. So that means that you have to, as a community, in the interest of the community, distinguish and distance yourself as much as possible from bad Negroes. If you're a good Negro, law abiding Negro, you distinguish and distance yourself from them bad Negroes for the sake of our racial reputation, for the, for the good of the community. Right now. Black Lives Matter rejected that approach, rejected that MO and that way of looking at the world. And that's why you had some tension between old civil rights establishment folks and BLM for uh, some time, right? Because BLM said, no, you know, a, a lot of these victims of police violence aren't morally immaculate, if you will. You know, uh, yes, Eric Garner was selling Lucy's on the sidewalk. Okay, yes, Walter Scott was running from, away from a police officer because, you know, maybe because he hadn't paid past child support. You know, they aren't, you, but you should not have to be, you know, um, Dudley damn do right in order to have, have minimum respect you know, as a human being and be treated with a minimum degree of respect by state actors who are acting under color of law in the name of us all, right? Police officers, right? So uh, I think uh, Black Lives Matter really went after that politics of, respect of, that, of respectability approach to civil rights, and it's been fabulously successful, and it's one of the things I'm trying to stress in the book as well, Sam.